What's up, Sagebrush? I'm Eric, and I am here with one of our executive pastors, Bob Church, and we are going to talk to you about international missions. And so uh, we want you to participate along with us on Facebook Live. If you're watching this live, you can enter questions if you want right here in the chat um, as well, and we'll just be answering as we go along. And so one of the first questions that we asked on the countdown was, have you ever been on an international mission trip? And if so, where did you go? So you could go ahead and fill that out if you'd like. In addition to that, we are going to ask a couple other questions to get you involved. First, I want to introduce Bob. Bob, why don't you say hello, and then let us know, what is your favorite outdoor activity? Oh, wow. Hello, everybody. It's uh, super great to be here today. Um, I love I, I love being outdoors. I am a big cyclist and also a trail runner, and those are like my two big passions. So anything outside uh, in the dirt makes me super happy. Yeah, so literally, um, before we started this, I was in a meeting and I'm looking out a window and in one of our hallways, uh, Bob is rolling his bicycle <laughs> through the hallway. You just see that <laughs> and we talked about this. How many miles do you think you've spent on a bicycle in your lifetime? Oh my gosh, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. Um, I, I got my first bike, where seriously, competitively uh, in 1986, mm. so it's been what, 34 years that I've wow. been riding a bicycle? So a long time. So a biker, runner. We had Andrew Poe on last week, and he said he was a serious, avid he runner. Is. But I think that's, compared to you, probably not quite as serious. Well, he just, he's just younger than me. Okay. That's all it is. He just doesn't, he just doesn't have the time. That Less I mean, time that's on the all. road. That's, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So in addition to that, um, and you've had kind of a lot of different hats here at the church. Yes. But before we get into that. Um, your wife has a pretty interesting business, I understand. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, my wife, she uh, she was a nurse for many, many years and kind of wanted to retire from nursing. And um, just she started her own little uh, French bulldog business. So she raises French bulldogs. Okay, so and we, they're really cute. We've got a couple of photos here. So there's one. <laughs> I think we got another I'm not one. plugging your business. They're just you, showing the photos. You see them yeah. Over there. yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh man, those things are cute. So they're cute. Uh, I know you didn't want to say the total number, but how many? We, uh, we have more than one dog. <laughs> okay, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a fun house. It's a very know, fun yeah, house, and we live in we live kind of in in the North Valley, and we have chickens too. So we have. Yeah, we're like little farmers. A lot of things going there on. There you go. Yep. So speaking of things going on, uh, how long have you lived in New Mexico? And can you share us share with us, like, what is your favorite hidden treasure here in the state? Wow. I, I was uh, uh, an army, a military kid, and, uh, and so I've been, I've been in the state since 1977, mm -hmm. so a long, long time. Uh, I think my biggest hidden treasure is uh, Taos Ski Valley. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, I mean, it, it's just that place. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I, it's just that place. Just like going in there. the winter. In yeah. the winter. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. awesome Great. Place. So as we talked about, Bob has had a lot of different hats, has a lot of different roles here at the church, but one of them is overseeing, um, you know, kind of throughout the years, helping build and develop our international missions right. department. So can you tell us a little bit about how and why you got involved in international mi missions here at Sagebrush? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, back in the early days, uh, when we were still at LBJ, uh, I'd come on staff and uh, we were doing missions sorta. Uh, you know, it was more kind of the, you know, pick a place and send a team and, and you know, it, it, it didn't really have an organization to it. Mm -hmm. And so the elders of the church wanted to really have a focused missions vision. Uh, so we hired a, a mission coaching agency called 1615 mm -hmm. and a, a great organization. And, uh, you know, they came and coached uh, our, our team about how to have a really, you know, solid mission program. And they mentioned this, uh, this concept called C2C, and that was church to community. So it was kind of this integrative model of the church, instead of just sending teams to kind of random places and doing random things, was how do we long-term involve ourselves in a community mm -hmm. and build sustainability in that community? Sure. And that struck such a chord with me. Yeah. Uh, it was something that, you know, I'd struggled with uh, as a Christian was this idea that, you know, these American teams would go to these countries and they, you know, they get great photos and have great experiences, but they never went back. Sure. And it, and it, and I knew that internationally, a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, the Americans got kind of a bad rap where they'd be like, you know, they're just, they'll, they're never coming back. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there was never a, an opportunity to, to build something sustainable over long term. Right. And it, and it, and so they just didn't, and I, I thought, boy, we got to do something different. So we started out, uh, the elders just said, go. Mm -hmm. And so we started um, 
calling people that we knew um, through this organization. Uh, they had some contacts, so we contacted everybody. And, and Todd and I uh, went on an initial trip to Amman, Jordan, uh, because during that time, uh, that was the the war with Iraq, and there was a lot wow. of Iraqi refugees that had, had filtered into Jordan. Uh, we started working a war as Mexico. And so we just kind of started following all these trails yeah. and looking for partners. Yeah. And so that's kind of how it started. And, mm. then, and then we just said, how do we do this to where we are not just sagebrush, but how do we find partners on the field in these countries that our local churches with the local pastor that we could come beside and really support them and kind of stand behind them and not not to to you know make it about us but mm-hmm. find out what they need what they need to do their job in their countries sure. and then help resource that with people funds all those kind of things and build long-term relationships. Yeah, and I want to get into that relationship piece in just a second. But okay. before we do, um, I think there's a little bit of a devil's advocate question, especially when it comes to the church. Okay, so um, this is what I hear sometimes from some Christians or, you know, kind of people on the fence going like, there's so many people here in our country. Why on earth would a church get involved in international missions? Why would Sage Rush want to even reach out and go outside when there's so many things we could do here? Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's a good question. And, uh you know, first of all, is you know Matthew twenty eight nineteen says, "Go and make disciples in all of all nations." And so it's like Jesus gave us that command. And you know, when you think about it, we we do missions in all in really kind of three concentric circles. If you look at it locally, um, you know, how do we involve ourselves in you know when we do that through M one Game Day, we partnership with ho- homeless ministries. All, it's, mm-hmm. There's a plethora of things that we do locally, yeah. and then you want to then you want to build that bridge to the next kind of level, and that would be like Mexico, places that are closer yep. that we have access to, but for people, you know, they can't go and uh, you know some people can never go long term mm-hmm. out into a you know to Africa for two weeks, mm-hmm. and so how do we make that available um, to serve a little bit outside of our geography, but still within the United right. States, and then the next is to go internationally, and, and really. It's about resources. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing is, is God has blessed America. Right. And we have resources that third world countries don't have. Yeah. And so how do we take that technology, those resources of people resources, mm-hmm. of capital res- resources, all those things, how do we take those into the world? Because the church is universal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There are Christians all over the world. I think you raise a good point. You're talking about how blessed we've been as a country Uh, and really finding those partnerships in in places. So obviously, when we recognize as a church that there's a gap in another country maybe that we can fill, can you talk about how that process starts? And specifically, like, uh, another question is, like, we don't want to just bring the American church to that country, right? Absolutely. Talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, part that's the beauty of how we are able to do those kind of things is is that we, because we look for uh, some real specifics— uh, when we go to a country, we look for a strong local church presence mm-hmm. or an organization that believes in the local church, mm-hmm. and, and because to us, the local church is the hope of the world. Oh, yeah. And so we that's that's kind of our first basis is, you know, who are those people? What are they doing? Mm-hmm. And then once we identify that, then we're able to go to that local church, and then we ask them something really basic. What do you need to uh-huh. reach your community? It, it becomes centered on their needs, mm. not what we think their needs right, are. Right. And so we let them define the parameters of what, what are you lacking or what do you need in your area that maybe we can bring through training mm-hmm. or partnerships? What, what do you need in your area to solidify your church and to bring more people to Christ? Yeah, and I love what you say, like asking for that strong local church presence. Yes. And so really, um, a church like Sagebrush comes in, and instead of making it about Sagebrush, we try to make it about that local church. Can you tell us why Why is that so important rather than just, because we have a ton of people. We could just keep sending mission trips, mission trips. Mission oh, trips. absolutely. Why are we trying to really build up that local church? Why is that so important? Well, it, it's when you think about it is, is that, first of all, the local church understands the culture okay. of where they are. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it, you go into a place like Haiti, we, we don't, as Americans, understand culturally how they think. Mm-hmm. And so the local church is in tune to that culture. Yeah. They're in tune to the people of that culture. 
So they know the needs in their own community. Mm -hmm. And so you start to look at that. And and here's the thing. They're going to be there. Mm -hmm. They're already there. They're doing the work of the ministry. And so they're doing that 365 days a year. Whereas for us, if we send a team three times a year, we're there for 21 days, Mm -hmm. 25 days. Mm -hmm. And so we're not there enough to build that consistency, that sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so if we can work with that local church and help them be able to establish kind of a, a, to be a beacon in their community and to do things that help bring health and healing to their community, then they can do that all day long and, and I, every day. And I think that also brings up a little bit of a trust issue too. Like not, you, you said that longevity, that sustainability, um, you know, you said we just, we keep coming back. So that yes. builds trust with, between the church and us, but also if their local church is the one that's leading the way, do you think that helps build the trust between their people and that church? Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, you know, part of that is, is that, you know, the one thing that, that you have to do um, in this in this world, in, in especially in third world countries, is you have to show up, mm. and you have to show up a lot because if you don't, then they just think that you're just kind of there for your own agenda. Right. And and there are times but when that's you sh- true in any serving, right? I mean, like absolute, counseling, anything else. A- like that, absolutely, it's showing up. It's showing up, yeah. and it, it's a, it's a simple concept, yet it's really hard to do mm-hmm. because you have to really sacrifice to show up. Sure. And it's not always convenient. It doesn't always go exactly the way you think it's going to go mm-hmm. every time. And so in that method of showing up, it proves that you're committed mm-hmm. no matter what. And and you have to, and people are skeptical. Sure. You know, all of a sudden you're in their culture mm-hmm. and they're like, what are they trying to use us? Mm-hmm. Do they want something from us? Do they, do they really care about us or is this mm-hmm. just to make them feel better? Right. And so... When you do that over and over and over again, then they get to know you, you get to know them, and then pretty soon, you you, you know, except for the language barrier, you become part of that culture. Sure. And how do those resources, I mean, it seems like an easy question, but how do, the, how do those resources get there? I mean, where do those come from? Do we have special donors? What ha- How does Sagebrush help um, provide those resources for people? Well, you know, I, in, in all kinds of crazy ways. Okay. And, uh, you know, like uh, we, like say medicine. Mm-hmm. We're, we're fortunate that uh, we, we, we're we able to uh, buy medicine in most of those countries. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, by buying medicine, number one, uh, you, you're not dealing with all the uh, getting stuff across the borders, you know, because uh, then then you're getting medicine that they are used to and they mm-hmm. use in their in their communities. Uh, most of these communities... They don't have. Well, they don't have doctors. Right. They don't. They don't have hospitals. They don't. They don't even have access to medicine. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and and then we'll we'll bring our own. You know, mm-hmm. things like aspirin and vitamins and things like that that we can easily bring. We just mule it in and yeah. bring people and just, you know, they in have their to, suitcases in suitcases like, and big bags, all those kind of things. And so, uh, you know, we try to we try to as much as we possibly can use local materials mm-hmm. and use local work sure. and and fund it that way and just partner with it. So then yeah. then you're building a local economy and uh, you're working within their own framework. Mm-hmm. And so so we you know we we creatively try to find out what our resources in every single community are. And, and that comes through our partners because they know their communities. Right. Well, and I think one of the things that you were telling me was a, a story about how, uh, especially in some of the work we've done in Haiti, is really specifically looking and finding the unique ways that we could help serve them. Yes. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that partnership, share some stories about you how bet. that has tra- oh, transformed that, their community? That partnership to me is, is it's just been the model for us. And um, it's probably been six years ago that, that we took our first trip uh, to an area of northwest Haiti called Lacoma. Um, it is a forgotten place. Mm. Uh, that's all I can tell you is, is that, you know, Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, Northwest Haiti is poorer than even the cities. Um, none of these people have running water. Uh, they don't have electricity. Uh, they have cholera issues. Oh, gosh, they have the, the disease and the things that are going on there mm-hmm. is really rough. And so uh, we, we uh, there, there's a hospital about an hour and a half by car away from Lacoma, mm-hmm. but they were, they had a clinic that was there, that was their clinic, but they didn't have the funds to keep the clinic going. Mm. And so there was two American nurses and an American doctor who just had heard about this place and they just started showing up. Wow. And we heard about them and we're like, wow, these, these people are just going and they're just giving of their own time, their own money. And they were making a small dent. And we said, how can we help this? And through our partner, 
uh, we started to grow this relationship. So we went to this clinic and started providing medical care. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then we, uh, once we started providing medical care and we did this, uh, you know, two or three times. Uh, and, and so then people started to get to know us. Mm -hmm. And then once that medical care, uh, then they, the working with the local pastor in order to have, uh, they have no power. So mm -hmm. we were able to get them a generator. Wow. And so we shipped a generator from the United States, you know, via Freightliner, uh, you know, big ship all the way there to get them a generator and got this generator going. So, so, so now they can power the clinic. And then, then we went from medical care to dental care. Mm. And then we've done veterinary care sure. there. And um, so, we, you know, we started adding things mm -hmm. and, and, and eye care. And then you start kind of building on this right. trust issue. And then uh, with, one, with our partner, they raised funds. We donated some funds to this and we put in a clean water system. Wow. And that clean water system began to be a beacon in this community mm -hmm. because now um, the problem was is that when they have when they'd have a cholera outbreak, th they people died. They yeah. just died. Right. It was awful. Right. It was awful. And so um, with clean water, that took care of that mm -hmm. issue. And so, um, but the beauty is is that they charge people just a nominal amount of money for clean water. Sure. So people walk for up to five to ten miles mm -hmm. to get clean water. They pay a little bit from the church. Right. They, they come, the people from the whole community. Right, but what I'm saying is they're now because you're providing these resources, you have people from the community coming to a church organization Correct. that's local. Yes, the church is right next door yeah. to the clinic, and right. it's all intermarried. You know what I mean? It's all interrelated. Everything so the works church together. really builds that trust of being that yes. beacon for yes. not only spiritual help, but helping people with their physical needs. As yes, well. and with that water system, they take the little bit of money that the people give, and they're able to use that money mm. to keep the water system going, to do the maintenance on it. And then they, they elected a local water board. <laughs> so, so, you know, so they, nice. they, they started their own governors. Yeah, infrastructure. And then the church owned. Uh, so we went from, you know, medical to, to a generator to a water system. And then the church owned five acres of property. Mm -hmm. And we, we call the area that we work in Haiti Zona because okay. it looks like Tucson. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go up there and you think Haiti is this lush, kind of beautiful, an tropical place. Yeah. yeah. Up in northwest Haiti, it looks like Tucson, Arizona. Mm. There's cactus. It's dry. It's hot. They don't get a ton of rain. So they, they, they have tons of problems growing crops. Right. And so they get enough rain, but they don't. If they had a cistern to hold water, they could provide crops for their people. So the so church they identified a problem. We don't have a cistern. Yes. And now they said we need someone to fill that gap. Yes. And then what happened? That's what we did is sagebrush through our wonderful, amazing donors. Uh, we were able to hire local labor mm -hmm. and build a cistern. Wow. And we take, the, there's a school next to the church. The rain comes off the roofs of the school, goes into the cistern, fills it up. Mm -hmm. The cistern drains down on this five acre barren piece of property. And now you cannot believe it. It is a lush, gorgeous piece of property wow. that has plantains. We provided uh, through a seed project here, mm -hmm. all the seeds they need to, to grow vegetables. Wow. So now the community takes part of this mm -hmm. community garden. And so, and with that, the beauty of this at the, is we, we got them to a place of sustainability. Mm -hmm. And and they they got themselves there. We just, we got to be alongside and helped. watch this. That's all we did. Yeah. And, um, and now the church, that local church has grown by 40% because 40%. of that. 40%. And there's going to be people in heaven because of that work mm -hmm. of, and that they got to hear the message of Jesus because we were able to help provide a garden. I think that's amazing because as we talk through here, uh, if you notice this, what Bob is saying, w there's people that are alive today that would not have been alive without Correct. donations to help build these things, right? Yes. There are people that will be in heaven and probably are in heaven now, you know, be, uh, because of the investment of people that will never know their name, yes. right? Yes. And then the other thing you were sharing with me too is like, there are sometimes these unique needs where you see that uh, you're sharing a story about girls weren't even going to school because of a unique need that they had. Do you want to share about that? Yeah, it was, it, we we found this out and it just, I mean, it literally, I, it made me cry. I, right. I couldn't believe it. it it's was, heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because it's so basic. But young girls going to school um, w when they were young, you know, uh, entering into puberty, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have, they started their menstrual cycle mm -hmm. and they didn't have any feminine hygiene products. Right. And because they didn't have feminine hygiene products, they were embarrassed. Mm. And and if they had an accident on their clothes, they wouldn't go back to school. Sure. They would quit school 
because they were so ashamed. And so here's a young girl who has an opportunity to get an education, Mm -hmm. and she has dropped out of school because of a menstrual cycle. And this is probably happening for generations, where you have generations of women that are not being educated past puberty. No no doubt. No doubt. And so um, we heard about this need. Sagebrushers jumped in and sewed these kits that Mm -hmm. are washable kits Mm -hmm. that you can give to a girl because you can't send something that's disposable because they can't refill it. Right. So it had to be Washable. Sustainable. Yeah, sure. And they can wash it. I mean, they have Mm -hmm. access to water and soap, and they did that. And so then now that these girls have these kits, they can stay in school and get their education. And it's that simple. Right. And and, But, you know, you think in America, no big deal. Mm -hmm. There, it was huge. A girl dropping out of school. Right. And now we could, by the love of people who love Christ and say, that's an easy thing to fix— we provide that, mm-hmm. and kids can stay in school. And these are so many things that I think, like when I'm hearing Bob talk about this, it's so many things that we take for granted. You know, m- me being here in the United States, if you live in the United States, you just take these things for granted that you can have running water, that you can mm-hmm. have food, that you can have basic access to medical services and hygiene products. Um, but we've recently figured out something here that helps us realize that we're taking a lot of things for granted. I mean, that's at stay-at-home orders. How has international mission shifted now that we're not able to travel, anything else like that? Oh, it's been, uh, unfortunately, it's been devastating. Mm. Um, you know, the, the thing that's interesting is as America goes as a country, so goes the rest of the world um, a, as far as a ripple effect. Um, you know, the American economy is so important to the rest of the world. Mm. And uh, the rest of the world depends on those supply goods, some of those orders coming in. And, and so it's, it's really, you know, wreaked havoc mm-hmm. on a lot of parts of the country. So the thing that they're finding is, is they're, they're finding mass unemployment. Mm-hmm. They're finding starvation, mm-hmm. um, you know. And so, so now, since we're not traveling, we've had to shift our focus. But that's the beauty of it, Eric, is, is that because we have partners in the field— yes. They're not, because you can't travel Mm -hmm. to those places right now. They're shut down. Mm -hmm. And so if we were so dependent on us being there, we'd be in trouble. But we, because our partners are on the ground in Nicaragua, we have a partnership with 15 churches that have local pastors. In Cuba, we have local pastors. In Haiti, Mm -hmm. we have local pastors. In Egypt, we have local pastors. And we're able to send them money Mm -hmm. because we trust them, we know them, we've worked with them. Build relationships with them. Yes, and then they are able to distribute food through the local church. We're doing that in Belize. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, uh, our team in Belize, uh, our our staff at the church in Belize is distributing food. Mm -hmm. We just sent two big pallets full of shirts and clothing because that was a need that they had there. And so they're going to, as soon as they get there here in the next week or so, Mm -hmm. they're going to start distributing those things. And so... That's the beauty of it is, is, and then the thing that makes it so great is those resources and that those meals come from the local church. Wow. And they're not just for church people. They don't they're, just have sagebrush stamped on them. They're, no. No. Not, no. And, then, and that gives the local p- pastors a chance mm-hmm. to minister to the hurting in their community. Yeah. And they become then, I, I would say, the source to go back to rather yes. than waiting for the Americans or waiting for yes. sagebrush to yes. come here. So. Some things have shifted, but it sounds like the work doesn't stop just because we can't travel. No, it doesn't okay. stop. So God is still, just like God, Pastor Todd has said, we, the church doesn't close, yeah. international missions doesn't stop, God hasn't stopped moving. In fact, he's probably moving in bigger ways now than than in, in years past as well. Well, and, I, you know, the, the beauty is, is that, you know, in talking to our partners, it, it's just, you know, they're, they're seeing great things happen mm-hmm. um, because, you know, who's— Who's for, who's here for a lost and dying world but right. the church, yeah. and that that's what makes me so excited is is that it gives our the pastors that we partner with that gives them the opportunity. That, I mean, they're doing what they're mm-hmm. supposed to do, mm-hmm. which, which is awesome. Yeah, and and, it, and now we just kind of you know we're we're doing things as much as we can internationally. We'll travel again one day, yep. and then you know locally we're doing a lot too. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's been really fun because now we're partners partnering with uh, Calvary and Citizens, and uh, this weekend uh, we have this convoy of hope, and we're going to be uh, giving a big two weeks worth of food. Uh, it's a big box of food out to uh, 
keep learning. 2,000. Yeah. 2,000 needy families in Albuquerque mm-hmm. in partnership with, you know, two of the other big churches in town. Yeah, just an and, opportunity for people to drive in and, and like yeah. you said, get food boxes that will sustain them for two weeks. You betcha. Because food, food issues are food issues no right. matter where you live. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what's great, too, about a partnership like that is what I, I think— when the local church realizes what the local church is there for, mm-hmm. right, now barriers start to drop and you say, hey, we could partner with someone internationally and we can partner with someone that's right down the street you in bet. order to do great things. You bet. And we're, and we're partnering with, uh, with Samaritan's Purse. Mm-hmm. Um, most of you probably have heard of them, and they're, they're, they're cutting edge when it, goes, when it comes to going into places mm-hmm. that war zones. You know, they were in New York uh, when, when COVID was really raging with mm-hmm. a mobile hospital. And they're gonna, they're taking they're going to do a, a month long deployment on the Navajo Nation, mm-hmm. uh, as you probably know. COVID is has really run rampant um, on the on the Navajo Nation, and so uh, um, we're we're partnering with them with with Calvary and, yep. and uh, citizens as well, and uh, we're we're going out and um, uh, giving donating to uh, buy uh, sanitation kits mm-hmm. for a family so they they can have you know kits to be able to you know, soap and hand mm-hmm. sanitizer that'll last them for quite some yeah, time. For the whole family. Yeah, because they're ha- they're ha- they have difficulty with running water and cleanliness and sanitation. So, yeah, so yeah for the whole family. And we're going to be partnering with them to do that. So that, you know, there's so many things to do. Right. The needs never go away. Right. It's just, it, it, you just have to learn how to refocus them, I guess. And, and I love how the mentality, uh, it, the mentality is transferable, right? You yes. partner with people that have the infrastructure. Yes. We partner with Samaritan's Purse because they know how to get into those areas yes. that we, it would take us too long to do, they're, right? They're, they're set up to do it. And you step in and you say, what do you need? And so for our international missions, it's those different areas. And then when you say Navajo Nation, what do you need? Sanitation kits, all that sort of thing. And so really those those principles are transferable from whatever that need may be. In, in Albuquerque, what do we need? We need food. So we yes. get those boxes together. You I want to ask you a couple of questions here that we saw in the chat before we uh, okay, end. Because this has been great. Um, we want to know, what is your favorite mission trip you've been on? Or what's the favorite area you like to go to? I know it's probably like your children. You like all of them equally. But. I do. I like them all. I uh-huh. mean, I really do. Um, you know, I probably I have to say that my my heart's in Haiti, um, and I and I think the reason for it is is that the the, the poverty's so extreme, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I, I just it, there's something about it mm-hmm. that uh, you know they have been kind of the they've just been treated poorly by the world in a lot of ways. Yep. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's, as a country, it's a mess. And, um, you know, when, it, well, not to mention people hurricanes have, come through, I mean, yeah, natural they, disasters, oh, a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's, it, it's definitely, it's definitely my favorite place. I love the people. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. The most kind, amazing, fantastic people. And, uh, that, that's probably the one that has, has kind of has stolen my heart. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but what is your weirdest culture shock moment traveling internationally? <laughs> weirdest culture shock. Wow. That's interesting. Um, I think the funniest one was, is, uh, uh, one of our missionary partners in, uh, Nicaragua, uh, he, uh, they, they ride around a lot on motorcycles because okay. motorcycles are cheap <laughs> sure. and, and this, they're cheap for fuel yeah. and they can get around all these kind of mountainous, crazy mm-hmm. areas. And he texted me before we were bringing a team. Uh, Nicaragua was a little bit more strict about bringing medicine in. So we okay. had to have all these, you know, we had to have the special orders from the government. We had to give them all this inventory and do all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And right before we were to leave, he said, hey, my motorcycle has got a flat tire. Okay. And I can't buy the tire here in Nicaragua. Can you bring <laughs> me a motorcycle tire? Yeah. And so I said, sure. So I, we bought a motorcycle tire, stuck it in my bag. And when we got to customs... We took, literally, we had probably $10,000 worth of medicine. Mm-hmm. All this medicine goes through the scanners and gets all checked off, no big deal. Mm-hmm. And the guy takes my bag and he goes, what's that in there? Uh-oh. And I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, that tire. And I go, it's a motorcycle tire. And he goes, well, why are you bringing it in the country? And you could see, <laughs> I could see our partner through the glass over there. He's yeah. looking at me. And he's seeing that the guy's <laughs> questioning about this tire. And and the guy, he's like giving me a hard time about this tire. Yeah. And I said, do you see that guy over there? I said, it's for his motorcycle. Right. He's a missionary in this country. Right. And the guy won't, he just won't have it. Right. So we got into like a pretty heated argument about the tire. Yeah. And he took my passport. And I mean, I'm like with the team, I'm thinking, 
I got to get this team in the country. He let all the team go through. Yeah. They were they were safe. And he's got me detained. All over a tire. All over a tire. And finally, <laughs> he stamped my passport like yeah. I was a bad boy. Okay. And I got in with the tire. And every time I go there, they look at that thing and I laugh and yeah. I go, okay, I made it. So, all right. Well, that's, that's pretty good. funny. Yeah. That's good. It's pretty funny. So I've seen a couple other people were sharing in there. I mean, obviously cold showers, right? Because we were oh, talking about Oh, gosh. Cold are, showers are rough. 20 degree showers, sleeping oh, yeah. on, you know, bare floors. Because it's not a vacation when no, you go to these with places. with bats. And, right. uh, we, you know, we had a, we had a, in Haiti one time, we had a, uh, we were sleep. We sleep in these tents on the ground, and mm-hmm. it's wild and crazy. And we had a witch doctor because because <laughs> they they really believe in witch doctors there. Okay. He was so mad that we were there in the community. He sat up and played drums all night long. Oh yeah. Okay. It was it was as hilarious. if it wasn't hard enough. And one s- of our doctors got up in the middle of the night and yelled down the hill, "Will you be quiet?" <laughs> it was oh, it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, we yeah, have that, lots of fun. That is great. So there, there's obviously some fun times. I mean, you talked about the impact that mission trips have on the individual going yes. as well. And so um, we, God willing, will be able to travel again. We don't know when that's going to be, but can right. you give us a couple of ways that uh, people at home can get connected to international missions? How can we donate? How can we travel? What do we need to do? Yeah. Well, you know, for right now, travel's pretty much off the table, and we're hoping that, you know, who knows? It depends on the countries. Mm-hmm. A lot of these countries are a little bit behind us in COVID, mm-hmm. and they're, and they're or they're not reporting and so they're and and they don't have the advanced medical systems sure. that we have, and so they they're they're suffering in different mm-hmm. ways. Um, so you know, I think the most important thing our people can do right now is is pray. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously uh, prayer is huge for our partners and all the people that are out there serving Christ in these different areas. Um, you know, you, you can you can still continue to be generous mm-hmm. because th- those. I mean, you're talking about basic needs. You know, we're we're talking about feeding people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a huge part. Um, so just to know. clarify, because I know sometimes we try to gloss over what being generous means. That means donating food and clothes and donating money. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, because in those countries, we can't. You know, right now we can't send food. We have right. to we have to send money, mm-hmm. and, they, and then they buy food, and that it helps their local economies right. too. When you think about that, mm-hmm. it stimulates their economies because. You know, if they're having if they're having food issues and people can't afford food, mm-hmm. what well, affects the grocery stores and the right. farmers and everybody else? Right. So, and so you know, those are, those are the big things. Yeah. Um, you know, you can always check us out at you know sagebrush.church slash you know front slash missions, mm-hmm. and, and that'll kind of keep you updated what's going on. Um, but right now, you know, we're just kind of we're on hold. Right. We're, you know, we're, we'll never stop. Right. We're just on hold as far as international travel. So if I, you know, if I could summarize here with with Bob before we let you go, one, pray, obviously, pray for the work that's being done, pray yes. for the local churches that are there. Oh, absolutely. But also, I think you would agree, pray for, you know, kind of what God has for you to do so that way you are prepared that when we're signing up for another mission trip, you're not thinking, well, now I'm going to pray about it and think about it and go yeah. through it. But really think, hey, when it's time, it, it, it is God calling me to go. Yes. But then also donating. So when you see donations like locally here um, in the States, we're collecting food and clothing items at every one of our physical campuses. But you can also go to sagebrush.church slash give and you can donate financially as well. And what I love about what Bob is saying here is like, you should feel uh, you should feel very safe and secure about where your donations are going because we vetted these people. Oh yes, we have locally. long we have long term partnerships that we trust. We work with day in day out. Um, we know their heart. We mm. we vetted them. They yep. vetted us. Right. Um, you know we we're not going anywhere, right. and they're not go. We're going to work with them, and we're going to press on, mm-hmm. and you know and and see how we can partner with them to see the work of the gospel all over the world. And there's already links going on. Thank you for some of our hosts that are popping those in there. Um, And so I want to say thank you to Bob. If if you have been um, impacted positively by our missions team, if you've gone on a missions trip, just go ahead and pop that in the comments and let us know. Let us know how much uh, that has meant to you personally. And you said something earlier, Bob, that I I wish we could have sat and and just held on to that for a minute. But you said, who else is there for a, a hurting, a hurting and dying world but the local yes. church? It's the church. It is the church. It's when you look all over the world, it's the church. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, if if you think the government's going to do it, no way. Right. It, it's the church, and and it's people who care. Only people who care like Jesus cares mm-hmm. can care like that. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it to see the to the see what the church does in the rest of the world. 
It's unbelievable. So the local it, church is the best. Thank you for spending about 30 minutes out of your lunch break with us here if you're watching later. I know I get pumped up just talking to Bob, and I, so if you need to watch this over just for a shot of adrenaline on how <laughs> awesome uh, it is to be able to be uh, used by God. Bob, is there anything that you want to say to the people at home before we go? Just, one day we'd love to take you to the field. It'll change your life. You know, it's... We don't do vacations. We do uh, kind of suffer fests. Mm -hmm. uh, we want you to we want you to go suffer a little bit. You know, be, be uncomfortable because That's that'll right. change your life. That's come right. with us. We'd love to have you. Great. So everyone, make sure that you pop in the comments. Let Bob know how much we appreciate the work that he and his team are doing. And uh, make sure you tune in tomorrow for our Sagebrush News. We've got another uh, great opportunity this weekend for you to join a service. Um, and then we'll see you again here next week. Thanks, awesome. everybody. Thanks.